coming up. I also think of anxiety as there's the smoke detector principle. Oh my God, smoke detector just went off of my house. (laughs) My name is Michelle Sen, and today I'm interviewing a therapist who uses evolutionary psychology to inform his work. Cody Gibson, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Cody Gibson. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in California. I was first introduced into evolutionary psychology in my undergraduate. I had a a professor named Eddie Vela in uh, Chico State University of California, Chico, and I did my senior seminar in uh, evolutionary psychology, actually. And, uh, you know, it really just changed how I saw everything else I'd learned in my, up until that point. <clears throat> and then I did my, my master's degree in marriage and family therapy at the same university. And so when I was doing my final um, analytical review it's called which is basically a thesis that you don't collect data it's like a literature review on a topic you want to dive deep into I chose him as my advisor even though he didn't teach in that program and he helped guide me towards the topic of um, my paper was called towards an evolutionary perspectives on psychopathology so then I was was able to then take the evolutionary theory and then apply that to um, you know mental illness and that kind of thing which helped prepare me for moving forward and using evolutionary psychology in my work as, as a therapist in my career. Um, and then after that, I sort of, I, at some point I discovered the Beat Your Genes podcast with Dr. Lyle. Um, and that's sort of how we connected was through that Facebook group. And he really just like really inspired me because mo- up until that point, I hadn't actually seen anyone apply it in that way you know most people just sort of think of evolutionary psychology as these underlying things in our psychology but he's like no you can actually take these principles and apply them to in the therapy room so I've, and then i've continued to read evolutionary psychology books um you know by authors like stephen pinker and um, david buss and you know, Dar- darwin's dangerous idea by daniel dennett and um uh, more uh, moral tribes by Joshua Green had a lot of influence on my thinking and like the moral end of things and um, so I've just sort of taken these principles and tried to apply them to my work while still maintaining the evidence-based practice of like whatever models I would a, a normal a regular therapist would use it's not something so different as um, Dr. Lyle might put it but I sort of weave it within my work with other people or with with using other models and things like that. Mm, Yes, that's brilliant. And your analytical review, which you wrote back in 2006, it blows my mind because it's so well done. (laughs) Like, so well done. (laughs) Thank you. And what is evolutionary psychology for those who don't know? So basically evolutionary psychology assumes that, you know, our brains are built by our genes and have, um, have evolved to solve adaptive problems that we continually faced over thousands of years in our in our past history, as um, typically when we were living as hunter gatherers in you know small tribes of like fifty to hundred people, um, and so um, that's and that those those are essentially pre-wired circuits that they call modules. That those pre-wired circuits are now being applied to the modern world, um, which we. Um, so sometimes problems can come up as a result of that, which is referred to as evolutionary mismatch theory, where you know we're using these Stone Age brain to apply it to problems in the modern world, and we're facing new and novel problems. And so sometimes that can, um, you know, cause difficulties for people. And so that's you know one of the first things that you might want to do if you're trying to apply evolutionary theory as a as a therapist, be like, how is, you know, what you're doing? How would have it been effective? 10,000 years ago, but it's not as effective now. Um, <clears throat> and then it also takes like an information processing um, model of the, of the brain, which basically says that the brain is constantly tra- processing the information from the environment um, from, uh, for biologically relevant information that'll help you to survive and reproduce. So, you know, evolutionary psychology or EP, as we like to shorthand it, um, will, uh, will often like basically assume that, you know, we're constantly looking <clears throat> at the environment for the things that are gonna help us to survive and reproduce. So whenever you're thinking about things in terms of evolutionary psychology, you kind of want, or quite often will come back to, you know, 
sex and survival and re and resources and that kind of thing. Um, and so um, essentially evolutionary psychology can be used as like a, a meta theory for other theories. Like, you know, that's sort of how I try and use it in my work is to like, you know, any evidence-based um, therapy is still useful whether you're using evolutionary psychology or not, but it can help be a theory that can connect between the different theories too. Um, so that's a useful way to integrate it. Into, I've integrated it into my work. Um, and then there's also the, you know, evolution psychology is essentially that there's these universal processes that are going on inside of everybody. And we find those out through cross-cultural and through twin studies and things like that, that if we're figuring out what are these universal processes, but then you know, not everyone is the same. And so there's also um, individual differences in, you know, how your own personal environment affects you and your own personal um, personality um, is made up. Um, <clears throat> so that's a few of the, the basic kind of overview of, of EP. Thank you so much. That was a great overview of all these different principles in EP. And can you talk more about the significant universals in counseling? Yeah, because um, sometimes we like we like we want to like think about things like uh, like if there's a relationship issue, like uh, reciprocal altruism is a major um, theory in in, uh, in EP, which basically says that you know the way like we we give to other people with the expectation that they're at some point going to be there for us too, and um, you know, sometimes people can get into situations where they're constantly giving and not receiving or you know if someone's you know in conflict with someone you want to be thinking about like well what is the social exchange that's going on here does the other person feel like they're being taken advantage of or are you upset because they're taking advantage of you and so you can kind of um, think about things in terms of like how to balance how to keep a balance in your relationships you know we don't keep a tit for tat one for one like oh i gave you two dollars so you owe me two dollars in terms of our social exchanges with our friends, but if you're the one always, you know, helping them move and helping them babysit, and then they don't, then when you ask a favor, they're like, oh, sorry, I'm busy. That makes you, that changes your cost benefit analysis on the relationship and, you know, maybe, and so that can cause problems. Um, another universal um, is uh, parental investment theory is a major idea, which, I think basically accounts for almost all differences in <clears throat> uh, the male female psychology. Essentially what parental investment theory says is that the, the sex that invests more in the offspring will be more choosy about who they mate with. And then the sex that doesn't is gonna be, um, have to compete for access to the highest quality mates. Um, and so, and then in the modern world, you know, we, we have birth control and, you know, it's not as big of a deal in the reality sense of it, but we still have these underlying evolved brain mechanisms where if a woman has sex with a man, she assumes biologically that there's like a 5% chance that she's, she's already pregnant. And so then, you know, that explains why women are more interested in, in, in monogamous long-term relationships and they want to find partners that are showing signals of, of commitment and, um, or high status and high resources, because those are the things that help the offspring to survive uh, back when we were hunter gatherers. Um, and then there's uh, inclusive fitness is another uh, major foundational theory in, in evolutionary psychology, which basically was says that you're more likely to make sacrifices for your kin. That the, the close the more genes you share with someone the more it's actually in your genes best interest to make sacrifices for that person because those genes live in another person. Um, but then in, in counseling, you know, sometimes people will, you know, they'll be in conflict with their family and they're like, well, you know, both culturally and biologically, they're being told family is the most important thing. I need to make sacrifices for my family, but, you know, maybe they're actually making too much, too much sacrifices and, you know, the family's making them miserable and we need to adjust how they create their boundaries with their family and what their what kind of sacrifices actually are appropriate in the modern world as opposed to just following what the genes are telling us would be a good decision 10,000 years ago. Um, and then uh, 
there's a uh, evolutionary trade-offs is a is a is a, a big theory where essentially um, what it, you know anytime we like the biggest example of trade-offs is is uh, in personality like we have <clears throat> you can't be both agreeable and disagreeable right like you have to like there have to be somewhere on a set point um, and so um, that's can be useful in thinking about um, individual people too. Um, and then, yeah, social status is, a, is also a major uh, piece of, of uh, evolutionary psychology. And, and like all people are sensitive to social status because um, you know, that was one of the main things that if you were had high social status in the tribe, then you were more likely to get the good mates. You were more likely to get the good like, you know, best cut of meat after the hunt. And um, so that translates into like literally millions of different behaviors in the modern world. Um, so one thing we like to think when we're <clears throat> looking at people and what's going on in their lives is if you're confused what's going on and what's why someone's doing what they're doing, the best place to start is thinking about social status. And how does this, this thing actually relate to, um, you know, status and because that's what would have helped the person to get the best mate and to and do and you know climb those dom dominance hierarchies that are in the competitive processes of life. Exactly, as Dr. Doug Lau says, look for where the status lies in any problem. Yeah. So you touched upon individual differences in personality. Can you explain more how evolutionary psychology helps explain these individual differences? Yeah. So um, essentially, we figured out. In psychology that um, there's five basic dimensions in personality that people differ on. Um, and you can think of each one of these as a bell curve. So most people kind of fall in the middle, um, but then it, you know, there's people on all on every position out towards the very far extremes too. And um, so like, you know, even though we want to think of like people in the middle as normal. It's all normal in the sense that if you're going to have a bell curve, you're going to expect people to be outliers too. But um, essentially, the further you are out on the edges of the bell curve, the more likely you are to make mistakes in your thinking because you're you're uh, have a distorted, essentially a distorted perception of reality in favor of a certain type of thinking. So the the five. Uh, the five uh, elements that we are, we can remember them with the acronym OCEAN, which um, stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, or better said is uh, emotional stability. Um, so for example, with, with openness, I think of the, the evolutionary trade-off there as um, safety in the known versus opportunity in the unknown. Um, so someone that's, you know, not very open, they may miss out on opportunities in life because they're like, oh no, I'd just rather not. I don't know what's going on with that. And so, um, but then on the opposite of the bell curve, someone that's really open, you know, they're going to have you know a pretty exciting life because they're always trying to do new things. But then you know they might get themselves into trouble because they they they're underestimating the risk of these new experiences and um, and so you know they may be open to like trying drugs and that kind of thing and then end up down that path which would get them into trouble. Um, and so it's, there's no right way to be on any of these, but, and in the stone age, it was best to be in the middle on all of these essentially, statistically speaking over the millennia. But in the modern world, some of these are, be you're better off on one side or the other. And so <clears throat> um, one other thing to consider when in personality is that it's, it's pretty much fixed. Like this is not something that we can easily change as a therapist. And so it can be very useful to pick out, to, to know your clients in terms of these, these five factors, because it, um, you know, where, where, where to target, you know, you, if someone's really, really introverted, you don't want to just be like, okay, well, we just need to do a certain this training and then you're going to be extroverted. Like that's not how it works. Um, and, you know, if someone's really not open to experience, you're not gonna like try and get them to do things they don't want to do, or you know introduce strange ideas and theories that they're not going to be open to listening to. Um, so you're gonna tailor how you communicate with 
people based on um, how you read their their levels on these different things. Um, so the the next one is conscientiousness. That's a really um, I look at that trade off as um, about conservation of energy. You know, when we were in the Stone Age, we only had so many calories, and you know, people starved to death all the time, and so you really had to be careful about how you spent your time and energy because if you spent your energy in the wrong on the wrong things in the wrong direction it could literally lead to death and so it was actually a, a good like being low in conscientiousness in the stone age might mean that you didn't waste your energy on something that you didn't need to um, but in the modern world we have basically unlimited number of calories that you have access to on a daily basis right like you could eat as many chocolate bars as you want you're not gonna starve in the Western world. Um, and so the single largest um, predictor of, of life outcome is actually being high conscientiousness in the modern world, um, because you're just more motivated to, to go the extra effort to climb that dominance hierarchy, to, to do that thing that, that you need to do in order to, to be a successful person. And you're going to be reliable and um, where someone that's um, low in conscientiousness just just kind of gonna float through life and isn't necessarily gonna uh, make those things happen we can move on to ex extroversion um, extroversion and introversion is essentially about um, you know investing in social capital it's how how many people do you is optimal for you to have in your network of people and you know when we were you know, 100,000 years ago, if you had like, you know, two or three really good friends that were you know, your hunting party or whatever, or like your group of people you gathered with, you knew that if those people were super solid in your life. You know, that was a really good, you, you had that, that capital there um, where, you know, if you were more extroverted, maybe you would, you know, not be really close with anyone, but pretty cool with everyone. Um, but then, you know, where on that spectrum is optimal for for having people to have your back because essentially in the stone age friendship was about like an insurance policy for if, if you got into trouble and you weren't able to feed yourself you know they would be there for you or you know if you were hurt or sick um you would have people there that would step up for you um and so but in the modern world you know we have such a a huge um possibility for networking and networking is such a makes such a difference in how successful we are in our lives um, and it's also on the flip side it's also very easy to get isolated in the modern world because you can just you know watch tv and play video games and listen to podcasts and youtube and not even hang out with anyone and it's actually tricking your brain into thinking that you're doing social activities because you're having you know, all of those kind of things light up the, the social networking circuits in your brain um, and so you can actually get feel very disconnected especially if you're very introverted and like you don't have a huge drive inside of you to go to the party or go hang out with a bunch of different friends every weekend and you're just like no I have my one friend and if he's busy then I'm not doing anything this weekend um, and so then that that can make people at risk for depression and that kind of thing and as a therapist like I always want to know where does someone fall on that so to help them to solve their own social situations, social problems, like, you know, if someone's really introverted, I'm not gonna like try and get them to, you know, go to more parties and do like really extroverted things as a way of solving their social issues. It's like, no, we need to figure out, or maybe like, like they're like, oh, yeah, I have one or two really good friends and that's the way I like it. I'm like, great, that's perfect for you. Like, that's not a problem. But if someone's like introverted, extroverted and they're like, yeah, I have one good friend, but you know, it doesn't really, do it for me, then it's like, okay, here's a problem that we can address together. And then the next one is agreeableness. So this is essentially estimating the cost of going along versus putting your foot down in conflicts of interest with people. You know, because we don't share our dreams with other people, we, we inevitably have conflicts of interest when there's relationships. And, you know, most people kind of fall in the middle of the bell curve and it's sort of in social exchanges, they're perfectly happy to do around a 50-50 trade. But, you know, some people are, they're really agreeable. They're overestimating the cost of saying no 
And so when someone asks them to do something or someone's trying to get them to go along with something that they don't want to, they just go, okay, sure. Like, because they want to just appease that person and they want to avoid conflict. Where if someone's really disagreeable, it's the opposite. They're constantly feeling like people are trying to take advantage of them and they underestimate the cost of saying of of you know saying no and putting their foot down is like it's my way or the highway and they can actually end up really damaging their social relationships as a result of um you know if they don't get the advantage in every social exchange they feel like they're being taken advantage of like you know if they don't get 60 percent advantage that feels like 50 percent to them and so they're distorted in, in how they see it um another interesting um, thing that can come up in counseling is that quite often someone that's really agreeable will end up with someone that's very disagreeable because they're they're trading matches and the, the agreeable person's happy to give you know give away the advantage to the disagreeable person all the time and then they also gain from the disagreeable person will be like their barking dog and will not allow other people to take advantage of them it's like essentially what's going on is that the disagreeable person is like i'm the only person only person that can take advantage of, of him <laughs> or her um and and so but when that can also cause huge issues for people because they're constantly being taken advantage of and feel like they're being walked over in the relationship and um so you can help people to to see how that's going on and Again, you can't change how someone is on these, but you know you can change people's individual cost-benefit analysis of specific relationships or specific contexts, or come up with you know pre-rehearsed strategies of how they're going to approach something so they are more effective and more able to um, you know, say no or like have have better boundaries and that kind of thing. Even if you can't change the overall agreeableness or disagreeableness across all situations in life. And then the <clears throat> and then the next on the personality spectrum is uh, neuroticism or uh, emotional stability. I I rarely will say neuroticism to people because it just has such a negative context. Even saying you're emotionally unstable sounds pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. So I'll, I'll usually just say the like you know not as emotionally stable or something like that to sort of soften the blow a little bit and. Um, Essentially, the the I think of it as the emotional sensitivity setting um, in your nervous system. So you know, some people are very sensitive and <clears throat> have really big emotions, and some people are less sensitive, and you know, they're just more even keel, and they're not as you know, when bad things happen, it's not as big a catastrophe, and when good things happen, they don't get as excited about it. Um, and you know, in the in the Stone Age, if you were had a lot of negative emotions. Those negative emotions were designed by evolution to keep you safe and to warn you about, you know, possible risks and, you know, and, and so you would, but in the modern world, it's not as dangerous of a world and like, you know, having these big negative emotions actually have, can have more negative impact because you're more susceptible to just, you know, having negative emotions and so you're more likely to be depressed and to, um, <clears throat> overreact and then you know end up hurting your relationships because when people get emotionally dysregulated you know they, they're much less rational and you know when you're saying and doing things from your emotions sometimes you'll say and do things that can end up hurting the relationship and um so like i'll take that as i'm doing, working with someone that's really emotionally unstable i'll help them to try and find like you know develop the strategy to hit the pause button on arguments and that kind of thing walk away do some kind of coping skills to regulate their emotions again and then you can always come back and have a discussion when you're not having these big emotions that are um, likely to lead you to say and do things that are um, not necessarily going to be helpful thank you cody that was a wonderful explanation of ocean and i love how you also say that Behavioral genetics teaches us that personality is stable over time, relatively. So this is why it's so important to know these traits and also for you as a therapist to understand where does your client lie along these different spectra. And as a therapist, you also see people with a variety of disorders. They come to you for, with issues like depression, anxiety, PTSD. So I'd love to hear, for instance, your take on depression. What causes it and how do you treat it? Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a 
a theory called the behavioral inhibition theory, which basically says that, you know, if we're, because like we, I mentioned earlier in the Stone Age, we only, we had limited calories, right? And so if we were doing things and constantly failing at them, we were better off doing nothing than continuing to waste our energy trying to, to, to do something that's not working. And um, so a, a lot of depression comes from what we would call failure feedback. You know, and it's in when people are not being successful in the really important domains of life, then they're likely to be depressed. And so you know, one of the first interventions I'll do is just to like anal do an analysis of, you know, how is your how are things with friends and family? How are things with work or school? How are things with in your romantic life? Because these were the three main competitive domains um, where humans were competing with each other within the tribe to get the best quality people to, to trade with. And, um, you know, more times than not, almost every time, if, if someone's depressed, they're not saying, oh yeah, I have, I have a job I love and I'm making, you know, really good money and I, and I have like the best romantic relationship I've had of my life. And I just have the most amazing group of friends and, and, and I'm constantly doing things with all these people and I'm being really successful. Like if that's true, you're probably not going to be depressed, even if you're genetically susceptible to it. Like um, depression is forgetting the number. I think it's, it's like 20 to 40% um, of the diff uh, individual differences on depression is, is due to genetics. Um, but even given that it's still, you know, it's just a predisposition. Like, you know, if you think about it, like you might have all the genes for being an alcoholic, but if you never drink alcohol, you're not an alcoholic. Um, and <clears throat> so I'll, I'll sort of normalize for people and be like, okay, well, you know, you, you have this, this, and this going on. I would expect you to be depressed. And so I think that it can be destigmatizing because you know people will be confused and be like, why am I depressed? Why don't I want to get out of bed? I'm having life is such a struggle. And it's like, well, yeah, because you've been having difficulty in these areas. And, and then it can also help us to hone in on what needs to change in order to, to address the depression. You know, if someone, you know, maybe they like their job and you know they, they have a romantic relationship that's decent, but they're, you know, that they're isolated from friends. And it's like, okay, what are we, what can we do to, to address that? And, you know, what are you doing that's leading to failure that other people are doing that's leading them to success? And you can help um, to, you know, create interventions to, to help target these different domains and to like work on the fundamental skills that are going to help the person to be more successful and to focus their efforts in a way. Um, and um, also in the modern world, it's, we don't need to conserve our calories. So the whole like, you know, it's called like the typical intervention for uh, depression is behavioral inter yeah. behavioral activation, which basically says, let's do something, you know, like depression's telling you, no, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything. I, I'm, I'm a loser. So why would I try? And so you sort of look at what is, where, what, how can we create a little bit more motivation? You don't need to conserve your calories so it's like if you can't get out of bed let's try and take a shower if you if you're not leaving the house let's try and go to the grocery store like uh, and sort of get people out there and moving and actually doing things because that's how you're going to have the opportunity to to interact with other people and then get the the positive feedback from important people in these areas which will then do the most to alleviate the depression because you're actually getting uh you're getting success feedback and when you get success feedback you go, okay, I can do this. I can handle life. And then the depression will reduce. Yes. And what about anxiety and panic? How do you treat and approach those? So I think of anxiety as a physiological response that helped us to avoid dangers in you know, the Stone Age. And so <clears throat> it was very helpful when we were trying to avoid predators to you know, have our blood pressure go up and have all the, you know, stop digesting food and have all of your the, the blood go to your limbs and um, have a heartbeat rate, heartbeat heart rate go up. Um, all of these things are very useful physiologically in avoiding a physical threat. But in the modern world, we're really unlikely to be running away from a predator. Um, that's just not an adaptive problem that we face. 
And so, you know, if you have a deadline at work or something like that, having all those physiological things going on in your body aren't actually going to help you to like get the paperwork done faster. You know, maybe the anxiety associated with it will, um, but um, the physiological responses aren't. So we can actually um, just target the physiological response um, rather to, to help the person. So um, exercise is, is really useful, especially like if someone's having a panic attack or something like that. Um, the, if you just you know do a bunch of push-ups or jumping jacks or running in place or do some burpees and then for a few minutes and then you stop, essentially you're, it tells your body, oh, I must have escaped the predator because why, well, I wouldn't have stopped running otherwise. You may have to do that a few times that you can actually cure a panic attack just through exercise. Um, and or if someone is, is really, has a stressful thing coming up that day, you know, you have a presentation or, um, you know, you just, or you just have a lot going on in your life and you're feeling really stressed out or it's harder to deal with it. You know, if you start your day with a, with exercise, you're going to have released a bunch of, a lot of that extra energy and, and feel more calm. Um, but there's other things too, you know, taking deep breaths is, has a, because the, when you're feeling anxious, you're pretty shallow. So, um, or, um, different mindfulness activities and things like that can help be regulating on, on the nervous system too. Um, I also think of anxiety as there's the smoke detector principle, which essentially says that we're better off having a bunch of false alarms than to fail to detect a true threat, because that would lead to the predator getting you and dying, right? So, um, you know, oh my God, smoke detector just went off in my house. <laughs> um, well, that was good timing. That was a false alarm. <laughs> Um, and, and so, um, and different people have their threat detectors set a little differently. Um, you know, and I, I kind of like to think of PTSD in that way too. It's, um, you know, it's people are having anxiety about related to, to threats. And when someone has a traumatic event happen to them, it actually makes them much more sensitive to potential threats. And especially to the, in the context of where the the negative thing happened. Um, and so, you know, PTSD is actually a whole bunch of really adaptive um, responses to, to in a dangerous situation. But the problem that comes up is we, we have um, a, you know, we end up applying these, these what's like would be helpful if it's you're in a war zone to in the in just everyday life and then it, it gets in the way of people's lives so um you know for for instance if you're have ptsd you know you're like just really avoidant of of different of situations that remind you of the trauma or you know like if something bad happened in a car you're not going to want to get in the car again but then if you can't drive to work then that's a major issue but if you just drive more carefully as a result oh, that's not really a problem <laughs> um and, you know, it makes us think about, you know, people will ruminate on what happened and, you know, people will have flashbacks or have bad dreams related to what happened. And it's like the way that that's the brain processing, um, because you really want to make sure that you've like looked at every single little possible angle and detail related to this horrible tragedy that happened to potentially try and avoid it again in the future. Um, but then, you know, if people get too stuck in that, and then they're not able to, to sleep or, you know, they're just constantly thinking about it and it's constantly stressing them out, then that could be a, a major problem. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, something I've found, it's not necessarily an evolutionary psychology principle, but it, um, exposure therapy, I've had a decent amount of success with working with people with trauma because, um, you know, essentially the brain is, always like it changes when it has new information available to it and so if you go to you know whatever the place is that's causing you a lot of anxiety or the activity or the thing that's the trigger but then do it in a way that is relatively safe and controlled or you know you start off maybe just imagining about it and then eventually go into looking about looking at it then you go to doing it and you kind of spike the anxiety and you sit there with it 
and then nothing bad happens and nothing terrible happens and then it goes down <clears throat> to uh to like a manageable level then the the brain kind of you do that a bunch of times in a row the brain will the sort of information processing of the brain goes, okay, maybe I'm overestimating the threat of the situation. And then the next time you go, it's a little bit less and you can actually um, face whatever it is that you couldn't face before. Thank you so much for sharing how you approach these mental conditions. I love how you both explain the theory and then give practical solutions, which I'm sure the audience will really appreciate. For example, <laughs> learning to do like jumping jacks burpees when one is anxious. That is really helpful, concrete advice. And personally for me, when I feel really anxious, I go exercise and that is like instant relief. It like burns off all that excess anxiety, just like it would have helped my Stone Age ancestors flee from predators. So it makes perfect sense. I'm wondering, what's your overall therapeutic approach? Can you talk about EP meta theory? Yeah, I mean, essentially I, I like to take an eclectic approach and you know, one of the big things that people have resistance against evolutionary theory is that it's, you know, they, they kind of feel like, well, you know, I have, there's all of these other theories that are perfectly legitimate. So why does this one think it's any better than the other? And the answer is that it's not, it just allows for first principles to, you know, unite different ideas, but, you know, any, any approach to therapy that is evidence-based can stand on its own as a legitimate therapy. But the way that I think of, of EP is that it allows me to go through these, to, to take from these different um, evidence-based practices and then unify them in a way so that depending on the individual needs of the client, I can tailor my interventions and what I'm, my approach to, to, to their needs. Um, so like, you know, for instance, like I use a lot of like motivational interviewing and uh, like humanistic therapy as a way to like just build rapport and to just sort of to like build out like, you know, what it flush out what exactly is going on with the person and um, and that, but then, you know, if there's a, and then solution focused therapy, you know, I think is really useful in allowing to change the like the steam processes that are going on, you know, really helping the person to, to see the positives in their life and the therapist is giving, um, you know, esteem cues to the person, which is, you know, might be temporarily filling in for the lack of esteem cues that they're getting in, in their life or like, you know, they're, or when people are depressed, they just don't see these positive things as much. So you can bring people to actually pick up on the esteem cues that are, that there would be otherwise be missing. Um, and, you know, a cognitive, a cognitive behavioral therapy approach can, it's still used to like deconstruct thoughts and feelings and biases and distortions and use it in the context of, of uh, you know, evolutionary thinking and, and, you know, bring in evolutionary mismatch theory and personality and all that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, like I mentioned exposure therapy before, and the, or I will do EMDR with people. Um, and I, I think those fit in, in terms of like an information processing thing. And like those approaches help the brain to process the information that's been, um, you know, become dysfunctional due to, to trauma and, or just high levels of anxiety and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm able to still, I don't have to like commit to one specific model. You know, I can take different tools from different models and different approaches and then unify them in my, in my own mind in terms of like, how does this fit in in the evolutionary framework? And I think that's one of the really powerful things about evolutionary psychology is that it allows for people to have to come from what we call first principles. You know, there's ultimate causes and proximal causes for, for everything. And so, you know, evolutionary psychology looks at the, the ultimate cause is, you know, we have these things that were adaptive in the Stone Age and these pre-wired circuits that helped us to, to solve these adaptive problems. And then, but in the proximal is, you know, what's going on in this person's relationship at this moment? What, and you know, what is going on in this person's life that's causing problems in this moment? And it has, you know, on the surface, nothing to do with the Stone Age. And so, you know, we keep that in our mind and you can be doing both. And so you're looking at, you're using these different models to 
approach the prox proximal causes, but then you could still keep evolutionary psychology in the back of your mind as a way to, to, to continue thinking about the ultimate causes about what's going on in someone's life. Yes, exactly. I love how you put it, how there are so many different approaches to therapy that are effective, but EP is the one that unifies everything and, like you said, help, helps explain the ultimate causes for our behavior. And this, in turn, can help a therapist choose which tools are perhaps best to help treat a patient. Yeah. Thank you so much for all you have shared today. You, It's just been such an action-packed interview in which you started with explaining EP and then you go into behavioral genetics and personality and then you talked about how you treat um, and approach mental conditions. You are both a therapist and just a fantastic teacher like I could see you as a professor honestly of like EP <laughs> theory and how to how to best counsel people and I think you're a person who's honestly at the forefront of helping educate people on EP especially since you're a therapist yourself. I see you as someone who can really reach out to therapists and speak to them on their level. Explain how, yes, all these all of these tools you learned in grad school are fantastic. And also, here's another tool that can help you even more with treating clients. You're just brilliant, Cody. Like, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I really appreciate you, like, motiv motivating me to sort of put myself out there a little bit and to, uh, you know, you're quite the inspiration, too. Now you're still like you know kind of near the beginning of your journey and, and already just sort of putting yourself out there and just searching out people that are gonna you know that have the information to share and then be like you know here's a platform let's see what happens like that's that's amazing it's really inspiring um you know as we talked earlier like i actually created a website of uh, a few years ago uh called evopsych.org and but you know i've just haven't, you know, just, I, I started it and then I kind of just let it go by the wayside. I haven't continued to, to keep working on it, but, you know, if people want to learn more about it, that's a good place to start to look for some resources. And, you know, I intend to, to continue to, you've helped inspire me to, to start working on it again and get it more updated and, you know, continue doing some blog posts and stuff there. Um, so thank you for everything you're doing too. <laughs> Oh, you're very welcome. And other people who have seen your website, they've been blown away. Like, like other people want to contribute, help pitch in. It's really an incredible resource. And yes, I do encourage the audience to check the website out. It is under construction, but it already has so many fantastic writings, resources, like how do you analyze the Super Bowl through an EP lens, things like that. I <laughs> absolutely love. And I think a lot of people like us, when they read this stuff, though, things will like click in their mind. They'll be like, wait, this makes so much sense. And suddenly the world just... Yeah, the world suddenly has more more meaning and reason behind it. How do people best contact you, Cody? My email is my first my first and last name, uh, Cody Gibson, C O D Y G I B S O N dot M F T, like marriage and family therapist, at gmail dot com. Awesome. I will put that link in the video description along with to evopsych dot org. Thank you again, Cody, for your time, and I look forward to seeing whatever you produce in the future. Thank you too, Michelle.